Today in Neville Goddard's The Power of Awareness, we will be reading Chapter 7, Attitude. <laughs> Experiments recently conducted by Merle Lawrence, Princeton, and Aldebert Ames Dartmouth in the latter's psychology laboratory at Hanover, New Hampshire, prove that what you see when you look at something depends not so much on what is there as on the assumption you make when you look. Since what we believe to be the real physical world is actually only an assumptive world, it is not surprising that these experiments prove that what appears to be solid reality is actually the result of expectation or assumption. Your assumptions determine not only what you see, but also what you do. For they govern all your conscious and subconscious movements toward the fulfillment of themselves. Over a century ago, this truth was stated by Emerson as follows. As the world was plastic and fluid in the hands of God, so it is ever to so much his attributes as we bring to it. To ignorance and sin, it is flint. They adapt themselves to it as they may, but in proportion as a man has anything in him divine, the firmament flows before him and takes his signet and form. Your assumption is the hand of God molding the firmament into the image of what you assume. The assumption of the wish fulfilled is the high tide that lifts you easily off the bar of the senses where you have so long lain stranded. It lifts the mind into prophecy in the full right sense of the word. And if you have that controlled imagination and absorbed attention, which it is possible to attain, you may be sure that all your assumptive implies will come to pass. When William Blake wrote, what seems to be is to those whom it seems to be. He was only repeating the eternal truth. There is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that steam with anything to be unclean, to him, it's unclean. You know that? Romans chapter 14, verse 14. Because there is nothing unclean of itself, or clean of itself, you should assume the best, and think only of that which is lovely and of good rapport. I love this line. It is not superior insight, but ignorance of this law of assumption, if you read into the greatness of men some littleness with which you might be familiar, or into some situation or circumstance an unfavorable conviction. It deserves repeating, man. It is not superior insight to get off your high horse if you think you're smarter than freaking the law of assumption. It is not superior insight, but ignorance of this law of assumption if you read into the greatness of men some littleness with which you may be familiar or into some situation or circumstance an unfavorable conviction. Your particular relationship to another influences your assumption in respect to that other and makes you see in him that which you do see. <laughs> your assumption, dude, your particular relationship to another influences your assumption with respect to that other, like your beliefs about the other, what you're assuming to be true. Right? And it makes you see that sh in him, the mind. Whoa, lots of um, amazing research that, you know, focus determines reality, man. You know? <laughs> if you can change your opinion, if you can change your opinion, left to right, whatever, man, if choice. If you can change your opinion of another, then what you now believe of him cannot be absolutely true, but is only relatively true. The following is an actual case history illustrating how the law of assumption works. 
One day, a costume designer described to me her difficulties in working with a prominent theatrical producer. She was convinced that he unjustly criticized and rejected her best work, and that often he was deliberately rude and unfair to her. Upon hearing her story, I explained that if she found the other rude and unfair, it was a sure sign that she herself was wanting and that it was not the producer, but herself that was in need of a new attitude. I told her that the power of this law of assumption and its practical application could be discovered only through experience and that only by assuming that the situation was already what she wanted it to be, could she prove that she could bring about the change desired prove that she could bring about the change desired. Her employer was merely bearing witness, telling her by his behavior what her concept of him was. I suggested that it was quite probable that she was carrying a conversation with him in her mind filled with criticism and recriminations. There was no doubt but that she was mentally arguing with the producer. For others only echo that which we whispered to them in secret. For others only echo that which we whisper to them in secret or yell at them in secret in our friggin' minds and in, in, in the pseudo arguments that God knows, man, God knows. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it out there. I've, I've, I've spent an inordinate amount of time. You see me now, a veteran of a thousand psychic wars. Dude, you know, a lot of it, I, I think PTSD, it's, it's like just preparing, pre prepare for battle. You know, knights, squires, you know, prepare for battle, right? But truly, I've gotten in, I, I, would, I would probably have to say, I, I can't even fathom the numbers in top. So we're talking like mathematics that I don't even get into, like square roots and shit of, of how many more fights and, and, and critical situations I had had in my mind. There was no doubt that she was mentally arguing with the producer. For others only echo that which we whisper to them in secret. For others only echo that which we whisper to them in secret. You see, you, you're pulling it out of them. Dude, I, I've pulled out of my worst, worst nightmarish people that have eroded and gnawed away and given me so much strife psychically in my life, literally. Literally, it's only an echo of what I was choosing to see them as, conscious or unconscious, conscious or unconscious. I was choosing, I was fueling the narrative with my own psychic fights and it was preparing, it was preparing to face that dragon if I ever had to face it, right? But... But it was, I suppose, PTSD, and I and I suppose I don't know, man. Others only echo what we whisper to them in secret. Seek and you shall find, right? Your focus determines your reality, right? You've been focusing on that shit and thinking like, like, you know, you know how she is. You know, you know what she's saying. You know what I mean? You know the truth of the situation, don't you? Huh? You know what I'm saying? I mean, maybe that's not you. Maybe, maybe you've got your own brand of this. I don't mean to put my stank on Neville Goddard's wonderful, wonderful words, but I mean, this is, this is my how it translates to me. I've, I, I, I confess, I too like this woman, you know, and, and, and Neville's words speak the truth. It's absolutely true. I would live within my own nightmare when, 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 you know, rarely, rarely did a confrontation boil up or, or occur between me and said people, but 
regardless of the nature of the confrontations and or whether or not they occurred, at the end of the day, I was left saddened by the loss of connection and all that the angst that I was riddled in. And I would, I would, I would have facts. I'd keep records. I mean, for myself, you know what I mean? Proof evidence like that. I'm not going mad. Like, oh no, no, that's a violation. All right. No, that's a sign that they definitely don't love me as I thought that they did. Whatever, whatever the narrative, but I'd find it. You find it in your thing. That's the thing. He didn't write this with me only in mind. I mean, this is, you know, if you're here listening to this, you know this applies to you. Only you know how. But you know it does. Because it, it does it's not about you. It's the data. It's a memory. It's not you. It's not your boss. It's the data, right? It's not the other person. It's not you. For others, only echo that which we whisper to them in secret. I asked her if it was not true that she talked to him mentally, and if so, what those conversations were like. She confessed that every morning, on her way to the theater, she told him just what she thought of him in a way she would never have dared address him in person. The intensity and force of her mental arguments with him automatically established his behavior. The intensity and force of her mental arguments, remember? The feeling of the wish fulfilled. It's not just about like, get all your dreams answered, man. It's, it's about like getting a handle on the truth of existence on earth here now in this life, in this physical plane of reality. Like for real, for real. <laughs> Listen, if you think you had the answers, you wouldn't be watching this vid. Okay, who we get, right? So I'm just here to share what I'm figuring out myself. And a lot of this is even happening organically while I speak to you now. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this co-creative revelatory moment of inspiration and epiphany. Yeah. So the intensity and force, the feeling of the wish fulfilled, because that's what this is about, right? It's not just about like, let your dreams come true, man, but it's also what reality is, right? Hmm. It is the product of what we imagine with feeling, with passion, with intensity, right? So the intensity and force of her mental arguments, of her mental arguments, all that dude, the destructive power of how that makes a person a little bit every day or every just, 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 it doesn't matter how often. It's just like, that's your life. It adds up and it's not even real. It's not even real. So many people are mentally engrossed in conversation and so few are happy about it, right? The very intensity of their feeling must lead them quickly to the unpleasant incident they themselves have mentally created and therefore must now encounter. Right? When she realized what she had been doing, she agreed to change her attitude and to live this law faithfully by assuming that her job was highly satisfactory and her relationship with the producer was a very happy one. To do this, she agreed that before going to sleep at night, on her way to work, and at other intervals during the day, she would imagine that he had congratulated her on her fine designs and that she in turn had thanked him for his praise and kindness. Her great delight, she discovered for herself that her own attitude was the cause of all that befell her. The behavior of her employer miraculously reversed itself. His attitude, echoing as it had always done, that which she had assumed, now reflected her changed concept of him. You change it inside the programming and then... Right? Bam. 
What she did was by the power of her imagination. Her persistent assumption influenced his behavior and determined his attitude toward her. Her persistent assumption. Right? With the passport of desire, oh, I love this. With the passport of desire and on the wings of controlled imagination, little flock of birds just flew by over there. That's cr crazy timing. She, a little God wink to that. With the passport of desire, which you got to have that passion and the will and the desire first, right? So, with the passport of desire and on the wings of a controlled imagination, she traveled into the future of her own predetermined existence. Predetermined. She thought it into being. She imagined it into being. She determined it before it wasn't it. Thus we see it is not facts, but that which we create in our imagination which shapes our lives. For most of the conflicts of the day are due to the want of a little imagination to cast the beam out of our own eye. It is the exact and literal minded who live in a fictitious world. As this designer, by her controlled imagination, started the subtle changes in her employer's mind, so can we, by control of our imagination, and wisely directed feeling solve our problems. By the intensity of her imagination and feeling, the designer cast a kind of enchantment on her producer's mind and caused him to think that his generous praise originated with him. Our often most elaborate and original thoughts are determined by another. So I see the point that Neville's making here. Although I, I will admit... She's perceiving it in a linear causality. Um, you don't erase the clouds so that the sun shines forth. So it's not that she cast a kind of enchantment that caused him to think that his generous praise originated with him. I think it was something less direct. A causes B, you know what I mean? I think it's a little less cause-effect. You know what I'm saying? Dr. Hugh Len did not clean on himself and use self-identity through Ho'oponopono so that he could heal an entire ward of mentally ill criminals. He simply did the cleaning and worked on himself. He just cleaned on his own experience of that while looking over the case files and such, right? And he just worked on that and cleaned the program within him, you know, using self-identity through Ho'oponopono by erasing the program in him and he erased in the other people, you know what I mean? By the intensity of her imagination and feeling, the designer cast a kind of enchantment on a producer's mind and kind of caused him to think his generous praise originated with him. She did that, that happened. And there's a closing quote here by William Butler Yeats. We should never be certain that it was not some woman treading in the wine press who began that song. Yeah, you know what? Let's hang off on that. Because I want to throw this in here, man. When I read this chapter here on attitude, like other ideas and quotes fell right into place. Like so much is just awakening and connecting. Instead of doing all the fighting in our heads, there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean, right? I mean, think about that, that that goes into our our thoughts regarding people. You know, our particular relationship to another influences our assumption with respect to that other and makes us see him or her what we see. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, <laughs> you know what I mean? And we get this sort of like fucking thing, right, on that person. And it's like, sure enough. See, I knew it. I knew it. Why? Because we keep on finding and looking for those things in life to help support our conviction of the ha see i was right crazy isn't it crazy but anyway you know change that and they change right abraham maslow said one's only rival is one's own potentialities one's only failure 
is failure to live up to one's own possibilities. In this sense, every man can be a king and must therefore be treated like a king. Dude, it's just beautiful, man. Yeah. Or you could keep on picking fights in your head. You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, but, you know, how do you want to live, man? How do you want to live? There's another quote by Abraham Maslow. Let people realize clearly that every time they threaten someone or humiliate or unnecessarily hurt or dominate or reject another human being, they become forces for the creation of psychopathology, even if these be small forces. Let them recognize that every person that is kind, helpful, decent, psychologically democratic, affectionate, and warm is a psychotherapeutic force, even though a small one. Neville said it, not yet in this book, I guess, about treating others as if their own wish is already fulfilled as well, like nevelizing upon them as well, their own wish fulfilled. You know, help bring that out. Can you imagine how much greater of a force, how much more fantastic I think the world would be Right? And the final quote by William Butler Yeats. We should never be certain that it was not some woman treading in the wine press who began that subtle change in men's minds, or that passion did not begin in the mind of some shepherd boy, lighting up his eyes for a moment before it ran upon its way. Power of awareness. Thanks for joining. If you like this, Barry cool. Denies the fact that you like me right now. You like me. <laughs>